A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, gas and electric cars used to live side by side in peaceful harmony. Then big industry did away with the friendly little electric car in the name of innovation and infrastructure. Fast forward 60 or so years and the combination of geopolitical challenges, rising energy costs, and changing attitudes towards the environment created confusion with the future viability of the internal combustion engine. About 20 years after that, a really cool car from a rather unexpected source was introduced to the market, but as soon as it was there, the same corporate interest said maybe you should leave the market and don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. But around this same time, the idea re surfaced of merging these two propulsion systems together in the same car. And while that very unusual concept gained popularity over the next 13 to 14 years, it wasn't until 2010 for the 2011 model year that we started to see two real electric cars on the market again, affordable electric cars. Which brings our little story to the current day where we have way more than two choices in affordable electric cars, and thus the car world moves into a completely different chapter, the second generation of affordable EVs. So today, let's drive Gen 2 of the best-selling affordable EV. Okay, so welcome to a rather cold morning in stunning Napa Valley. We talked about in the tech review that says 33% more power from its EV propulsion system. So with that, let's put our foot into it. Uh, no systems on, little torque steer, but it's quick. Um, yeah, noticeably quicker than the 2017, but the thing that hasn't changed is it still has torque from zero, which is something inherent in EVs. Here, now that there's more power, it's even more of a good thing. Now, a little bit behind the scenes here, when I go on these car launches, the OEMs are usually very good about bringing really cool stuff, things like car porn that I've used in other episodes. Now, Nissan didn't bring any naked bits of the Leaf, but they did bring something rather unusual, and it's called the Leaf to Home. And what it is is a transfer case of power to turn your Leaf into a power source, not an electric car. So the idea is to be able to plug the car into this Leaf to Home thing and then plug your home into this. So this is effectively a generator. Now, in theory, this can be used when electricity rates are high, so you can use the stored energy from the car, thus lowering your bill. Now this, nowhere I've seen after some digging, is this business case proven. However, after doing some digging, what I found is this is more for cases when power isn't available. Think like an earthquake. So in Japan, this little gizmo is on offer for 5,000 US dollars, but there's a government rebate for $2,500. And in those cases, it doesn't matter what it costs, it just gets you the power that you need. Okay, so found a less than perfect road here to talk about driving dynamics. And here there isn't a lot to discuss because it's still based on effectively the same platform. Yeah, there were some suspension changes we talked about in the tech review, but it's still very much a leaf, which is to say a good thing. Remember, the batteries are low in the car, so you got a low center of gravity, but you still have a torsion beam back there. So if I push it on this turn a bit far, it, you definitely feel some lean. Not so much squat in the outer rear corner, just more lean because of the size and height of the car. And then if I hit the brakes hard, you definitely get some dive in the front. But is this a GTR? No, it's not trying to be a GTR. It's just significantly more refined now in this new generation with the suspension changes, which make it an overall better package to drive around town. And I would argue a bit more fun to drive because I personally find EVs significantly fun to drive because of torque from zero and the overall way the power is delivered. Greetings from an entirely different episode. I wanted to use a car fitted with an internal combustion engine to demonstrate the concept of a hybrid heater system. Not entirely a new concept for the Nissan LEAF. It was first fitted in the car in a 2013 model year, and at that only to the fancy models. But I feel it's an important concept, so let's recap here. Basically, a car fitted with an internal combustion engine, the way it sends heat to the passenger compartment is through a coolant loop, the radiator, the heater core, that kind of stuff. Uh, well, a LEAF doesn't have any of this, so it makes do with really two things. The first is a heat pump, but that's only for mild climates. And what it does, now this is way above my pay grade, but very basically, it takes hot air out of 
cold air. Believe it or not, that's possible. And effectively, what it's doing is the reverse of an air conditioning system. Then there's this. Well, not exactly this form factor, but you get the idea. There's a thermal coil hidden somewhere in the leaf, and its entire goal is very cold climates when you need to make the interior toasty warm. There's only one downside. It is not efficient at all. It drains the battery pretty quickly, which is why Nissan engineers have opted for this hybrid system. So when there's not as much load, like in mild climates, it doesn't need to use this. It can use the heat pump and thus less strain on the battery. So the combination of the two replace that coolant loop in the internal combustion engine. And at least in the higher end models, it has both. In the lower end models, as well as some other EVs, it's just got this, which drains the battery a bit more. You get it now? Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's do two things. Number one, let's try to catch up with the traffic ahead of us. Because of number two, let's turn on this e-pedal. Now, we have experienced this before in two other cars. Uh, remember the BMW i3 and uh, the Ioniq that uh, has three levels of this type of one-pedal driving. That's effectively what it is. So right now, I've got the car in e-pedal mode. I'm not going to use the brake, but look what happens as I catch up to the car in front of me. This is not a car, a GMC pickup truck. Please don't try this at home. I've got my foot off the accelerator, not on the brake, and the car comes to not a complete stop, but it slows itself down. And there's a couple of things going on here. Number one, you know how in like a regular internal combustion engine, it has a, there's a torque creep there where the torque converter is trying to slow down the car effectively like it's a downshift. That torque creep is gone, obviously, because there isn't a torque converter, there isn't an internal combustion engine. But it's mimicked a different way. Uh, there's the actual motor that has some torque to slow the car down, so some negative torque. Now, an important thing to note here is the road gets a bit more challenging. Yes, there is a regen system working in this e-pedal mode, but it's not necessarily the brakes doing it. What's happening is the motor is slowing the car down as I pull my foot off the brake, and the regen is, is basically scavenging that, that energy back through the brake system, but the brakes aren't being actuated. Get it? Now, on top of that, there are two different states of regen. When the battery is not fully charged, the system will then take the energy that it's getting from the regen system and replenish the battery. But let's say for the sake of discussion, the battery is almost charged, then the regen system is not gonna try to put energy back in, say, a container that's already full. What it will do in those cases is send the energy back to the system to either propel the car or continue that slowdown process of the e-pedal system. Now, the e-pedal system has another interesting benefit, change, impact on driving dynamics, and that's passing. So right now, I've got the e-pedal system on. I'm going to pass this truck here, and it passes, but you got to push it a little bit harder because the system obviously is set up differently with e-pedal. There's more resistance to it. But now let's try this again, e-pedal system off, past this Explorer, actually a Mazda Navajo, another Explorer, and you still get the same passing power, which I gotta say is really good. Better package overall, this Leaf, in terms of driving, but you don't have as much resistance with the e-pedal system off, which makes times when you need more power a little bit easier. Okay, so if you have a keen eye, you know this is not A, an Aston Martin, or B, a Mazda MX-5 RF. Even still, I am not going to pontificate. And that's because, full disclosure, I am a huge fan of these. So much so that you may have seen other episodes where I have pushed many a friend to use versions of this. And it's not just because I'm a Dave Ramsey cheapskate, but because I love the way these things drive. And I know we talked about this in the tech review, how the design, it's more like a real car. But it's not just the design, it's kind of the stuff you don't see. The electric motor, some of the changes to the driving dynamics, the packaging. It makes it, the only way to describe it is that there's more refinement, which makes it drive like a real car, not a spaceship. To the point where almost the propulsion system is a secondary consideration. Now I want to do something that I never do on the show, and that is talk politics. Today is Friday, December 8th. And as I'm delivering this to you, there is a huge debate going on in Washington about taxes, not just tax cuts, but the incentives on these things. They may be going away. And as you know, it's anywhere between five and $10,000 off the price of your vehicle. So my question to you is this, 
If that all of a sudden disappears, would you still buy a B-segment electric car that is 30 to say 30, this one's 37.5 the way it sits, would you still buy this? Or would it disincent you and push you to something else? If so, what would you buy? And let me know what region of the world you hail from and do you drive an electric car? Let me know in the comments below or via our social media, Motoman TV on Word, Motoman TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I say to you until the next full first drive review, bis später.